Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited to have Troy Vossler. He's co-founder of Generator, that's with an eight, which is an accelerator for startups based in Wisconsin, the good old state of Wisconsin. They've helped over 25 companies launch, get funding and traction. We'll find out how and what they did. Troy is a three-time graduate of University of Wisconsin at Madison. And one time was not enough. BA, JD, MBA. He's also founded the very popular apparel company, Scani Nation, which I own some gear from and extended right. the Scani brand by releasing Scani beer. Um, yeah, when I brought my newborn up, we uh, posed her in one of the Scani. I mean, you know, I didn't know it was you at the time, but one of the Scani little uh, like onesie yeah. things. Yeah. So, <laughs> very cute. Thanks well, for thank joining you. me. Thanks for being a customer. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to hearing your big lessons, insights, um, some of the mistakes along the way. And I always like to include a fun fact. Fun fact about you is you are an Eagle Scout. That's right. So how does that help you in business? Yeah, good question. Um, so I, th I think it has a lot to do with uh, perseverance and um, sticking to a goal and ultimately accomplishing that through thick and thin. Um, so in the case of you know, my time as a Boy Scout and ultimately earning the rank of Eagle um, was throughout my middle school and, and high school years. Uh, just a lot to do with motivation, a lot of motivation for my family, my parents. Um, but being focused on a goal uh, and focused on something that others may, you know, not be so interested in. Um, but I think that's a very applicable lesson to, to life and to business. So oftentimes, uh, depending on what your business is, you know, your focus is going to be on something other than even some of your co-founders or some of your employees, right. uh, some of your competitors and so forth. Um, but staying focused on that goal and, and understanding the tasks that need to be accomplished and, and just going out and doing them. So what was the hardest part about becoming an Eagle Scout? Uh, I'd have to say the final service project. So for me, uh, I worked with a, a local nature center, nature preserve, and uh, they had an old bird blind. So this is a structure that bird watchers could uh, go into um, and not scare the birds away. So if they wanted to observe the birds and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, working to build a new structure, a new bird blind. Oh, wow. You so build a whole new one. So that project itself, uh, you know, from from the planning, the budgeting, um, working with the the host, so the the nature preserve, um, and their their maintenance crew and, and buildings and grounds crew, uh, and then volunteers, uh, you know, in addition to my family, other scouts in the troop and so forth, coordinating all those different pieces to uh, going from just an idea to actually a finished product. Sounds like a startup. It's, it's very simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there's definitely an analogy there. Um, so Troy, tell me before we get into some of your companies and your big lessons, um, where'd you grow up and what was a big influence for you growing up? Yeah. So I grew up in Brown Deer, Wisconsin, which is just north of Milwaukee. Um, I'd say growing up, uh, my influences really were my parents. So my parents um, started their own business. It was a, a light manufacturing company. They designed and manufactured um, salt and sand spreaders, so big metal things that would go on the back of either a garden tractor or yeah, uh, yeah. and so forth for mostly colleges, universities, and hospital centers and clinic centers that would have a, a lot of sidewalks that in the wintertime they needed to um, lay salt and sand yeah. down for ice control. Uh, so growing up, you know, I never had an experience of parents that worked a traditional job. They didn't. Mm -hmm. I never had parents that worked a nine to five. So the whole concept of um, work life flow or balance, um, you know, I, I I experienced that kind of flow firsthand. I never had an environment where there's a set schedule or where dinner was at the mm -hmm. same time each night or same place each night mm -hmm. or things of that nature. Um, and so that definitely became part of my DNA, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, other things like. Um, kind of my my tolerance for risk. So having grown up in an environment where my parents started their own company, my grandparents had their own company. Um, I there's no 
fear of starting something new. There was no fear of entrepreneurship. And so when I proposed starting my own company, it was it was an ordinary thing. It wasn't yeah. unique necessarily. So uh, I think that was very fundamental. Yeah. So, Trey, what was an example of some of the ups and downs that you experienced that you saw firsthand that was probably normal to you as a kid, but most sure. people didn't experience if their parents were just working like a nine so, to five? So I'd say, you know, the, probably the one that impacted me the most firsthand was um, uh, just managing people, managing employees and whatnot. And so uh, oftentimes there might be a shipment that needed to go out from the factory, from the facility. And if certain employees didn't show up or weren't there at the right time, but we had to meet there for the, the truck, which was picking up the order. Um, I would, I, I remember multiple times where my dad would wake me up and <clears throat> before school started and every time that happened, I knew two things. I knew one, that he probably needed my help at the factory. Uh, and two, I knew that that meant I didn't have to take the school bus and my dad would drop me off at school, which was kind of a treat uh, for whatever reason that I, I always viewed that as a treat. So I can recall, you know, a number of times where, you know, I get up early and go to the factory with my dad and uh, help on one thing or another uh, along the assembly line. Um, and so I think that was, that was you know, a learning lesson. You, as an owner, you got to do what you got to do and mm -hmm. use the resources you have and sometimes that's your family. Um, so I'd, I'd say stories like that are, are uh, what kind of brought Pretty us Pretty common. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, other stories I can remember are uh, direct mail campaigns. So this yeah. is kind of pre-internet, pre-email, um, and the whole family. So there's five of us all sitting around the kitchen table and kind of having an assembly line where one would, you know, stuff the envelope, one would add the stamp, one would seal the envelope. Uh, I, I can remember doing that a number of times, but it, we always had fun doing it. Even though it ultimately was work, it was it was definitely a, a family experience. Yeah, I love that. And it's learning and it's interesting. So I want to ask about that. What is something that you found that worked with the direct mail? It's funny because I've been interviewing some of the top direct response copywriters and mailers in okay. the, in the world lately so i want to know what you learned from those early days so uh so we definitely in, involved the family a lot so i can remember times where we would have a family picture sometimes even our christmas card which would be the the family um uh standing around one of the new <laughs> machines that we manufactured mm -hmm. design uh and then we would use that in some of the direct mail to talk about how this is you know a family-owned company mm, yeah uh, um, so we definitely would tie that tie that into the experience, but at the time, you know, I, I uh, you know, I was young, but I think the direct mail, considering that we, you know, my parents did it multiple times, uh, was successful was working yeah. uh, at getting to the appropriate decision maker. So yeah. in their case, it was you know directors of buildings and grounds for colleges, universities, and hospitals. Mm -hmm. So when did you start your first endeavor then? So really, the the first real endeavor that I had uh, was Scotty Nation, what's mm -hmm. the t-shirt company. Um, and the story behind that really was uh, I had grown up in Milwaukee. Uh, after graduating from high school, I then uh, went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And upon arriving, lived in the dorms, um, met another guy who I had no connection to. I didn't know previously. We weren't friends or anything like that. Uh, but we quickly became friends by virtue of living on the same dorm floor, totally random. And quickly realized we both kind of had this entrepreneurial spirit, this entrepreneurial bug, and wanted to start a business together. But we really had no idea what that business was going to be. Uh, and so we spent all of our time together brainstorming. So whether it was in the cafeteria together or walking to class or, or just hanging out in each other's rooms, we would always be brainstorming business ideas. And those range from things like an online dating service just for – UW students. This is kind of pre-Facebook and a, a lot of online services like that. All the way to things like a gasoline delivery service where we would fill gasoline containers at gas stations off campus, bring them to campus and fill up scooters and mopeds. Okay. Uh, but you know, we didn't we weren't passionate about any of these ideas. We yeah. didn't want to smell like gasoline all day. <laughs> and so we just kept going back to the drawing board. Until finally, it was the spring semester of our freshman year, so the spring of 2004, when uh, Ben and I, uh, we had always heard the word SCANI used ar around campus, around Madison, around Wisconsin, as a w way to refer to someone from Wisconsin. So in that sense, synonymous with Wisconsinite mm -hmm. or cheesehead. Right, right, right. And so that quickly- I got the fib, and yeah. I didn't actually know what that meant until I went to Ma Wisconsin. And I was like, wow, that's, you don't like people from Illinois. I didn't know that, but yeah. So. Well, I, I like you, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, um, uh, we said, well, why don't we create a brand around that? So 
we, we knew that there was something unique about Wisconsin, Wisconsin culture, where people really took a lot of pride in their state. So I think the, a cheese head is a perfect example of wearing a foam block of cheese on your yes. head to kind of exhibit your identity and your state pride. Um, but we wanted a way to show that in a kind of a more fashion forward, a less over the top or less hokey way. And so for us, that became the Scani t-shirt. Yeah. And so that quickly snowballed into Scani Nation. It was really this movement to take pride in the state mm-hmm. of Wisconsin. Um, and if you go to our website, scani.com, you can read, you know, we have the a, back kind of a story, fun, yeah. fun, fun definition that we use for the word. And it's really an identity for anyone, not just people who are from Wisconsin, although that's where it started, but anyone who embraces the Wisconsin lifestyle. So anything beer, brats, and cheese, you know, that's all fair game for us mm-hmm. from, a, from a company, yeah. from a brand perspective. So. I mean- from Scott, I mean, a lot of people have ideas, and some people start them, or some people don't do anything with them. How did you implement and start getting traction? So we, uh, this was new to us. We, you know, even though I, I grew up in a family that that practiced entrepreneurship, this was my first company. And so, um, for starters, Ben and I each contrib- contributed three hundred dollars. So we started with six hundred bucks. We printed one hundred T-shirts. And we literally started selling them out of our dorm room, mm-hmm. and uh, we ended up selling out in about a week. Wow! What and did they, what would the originals look like? So two styles. One was red with white scani across the chest. Okay. The very other was, classic, yeah. Very classic. The other was gray, and then it had red prints, and it had a logo of the United States, uh, and said Scani Nation, and then the state of Wisconsin was filled in with red as well. Um, so two styles. Uh, we had fifty of each, a hundred total. Ended up selling out in about a week, wow. and then we really realized we were onto something. Um, and we just made an agreement to constantly reinvest the profits back into the business, which allowed us to order larger and larger volumes, and economies of scale kicked in, and so our, our marginal cost would go down, and so forth. Um, but from there, we really just became sponges. So we talked to everyone we could, whether it was professors at the university. Um, uh, entrepreneurial resources like the Small Business Development Center, uh, family members, uh, just to get advice about what we're supposed to do, both from a strategic standpoint, yeah. but uh, at that time, more importantly, just from a nuts and bolts standpoint. So yeah. from there, we formed an LLC, Scotty Nation LLC. Um, we trademarked the word initially just in the state of Wisconsin, later at the federal level. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Learned about sales tax and collecting and remitting and reporting of sales tax. Uh, income tax and tax returns at the end of the year, all those issues we, we, we learned about and figured out. And I think in many respects, having to go through the struggle of learning all those things on our own, I think really proved that we were passionate and wanted to do this. Whereas I think if, if this was just a flash in the pan, mm-hmm. we would have encountered some of that turbulence of, oh, we got to do sales tax and now this and that. And we probably would have just abandoned it. Um, but I think the fact that we made it through that whole process spoke to our perseverance and, and desire to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so from there, you know, we, we initially started just selling out of our dorm room. We realized that that wasn't scalable, especially when we had to go to class and, and what. <laughs> and um, uh, eventually started selling wholesale to third party retailers. So these are folks like the campus bookstore or other apparel stores uh, in, in the campus or downtown area. We eventually started selling online via scani.com. Um, and uh, kind of jumping to today, we, we partnered with our screen printer, Underground Printing. So it's a separate company that, that does all of our screen printing. Uh, and they opened a store then in Madison, uh, which we co-branded. So it's the Underground Printing, Scotty Nation store on State Street in Madison. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we have a brick and mortar location as well as online sales and wholesale sales. So what are some of the pitfalls people should watch out for? when going into wholesaling to retail places? Yeah, good question. So I get a lot of uh, people, uh, primarily students, that approach me that, that want to start a t-shirt company. And, and I readily admit that it's probably the most cliche college business that one can start. No, but there's um, big business. I mean, there's like Teespring. There's other big com- sure, you know, yeah. companies where people can do it. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And so my advice always is uh, frequently, and this is true of all types of entrepreneurship, not just retail trade or whatnot, um, but they have a lot of plans and, and oftentimes they're looking for advice on how to optimize for what I call 2.0 problems. Okay. So they're asking questions about order fulfillment and distribution at very large scales. Uh, without ever having proved or validated that the they got to get in their dorm room and sell sell t-shirts, right? Agreed. And yeah. so, um, you know, we didn't do that by design. That was just happenstance. You know, we didn't read it in a book or anything like that. 
Um, but I think it, how it played out was was very formative and it helped validate what we were doing. And so I actively encourage people to, to do that. So practice lean startup. So if, if, let's use t-shirts as an example. If you want to start a t-shirt company, prove that to me that you can sell 100. Um, because if you can't sell 100 just to friends and acquaintances and people you know, you, odds are you're not going to be able to sell 1,000 or 100,000, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so my focus is always you know, do whatever you can in a very manual and hands-on way to validate that the, that the market wants your product or wants your service. Um, specific to t-shirts or other retail trades, you know, there's many sites that, that now exist um, that are just great platforms. So things like Shopify, uh, which is just an e-commerce platform yeah. where you can upload items and they take care of all the credit card processing and, and whatnot. They can even hook into order fulfillment groups like Amazon Fulfillment where you can ship to a distribution center all your inventory and they'll handle all the shipping and returns and customer service. Uh, on the t-shirt side of things, there are sites, as you were mentioning, you know, Spreadshirt.com, uh, Zazzle.com, where you can create your own t-shirt store online and you mm -hmm. can upload your own designs, you can select the colors, you can set the price and then they actually take care of all the sourcing even. So they'll actually print the shirts on demand, ship them to the customer in exchange for, for a commission or royalty that, that you get in that transaction. Again, it's, it's not going to be as profitable as if you kind of vertically integrate and take care of all the sourcing and order fulfillment yourself. But I think they're great platforms, especially to do an MVP, to prove right. that people want your product or your service or your design or your slogan, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what was the next major milestone with Scotty Nation? Sure. So I'd say, you know, I, uh, I can remember walking down the street with, with my partner, Ben, and saying, you know, we'd love to open a, we'd love to have a store someday. And I think from the time we had that conversation, it was literally less than 18 months until we actually did. Oh. Um, and in, in that sense, we didn't do it on our, on our own. Uh, we partnered with someone else. And, and I think that's another important lesson is, is be self-aware of what your core competency is yeah. and be, be happy to, to, outsource or contract out those other capabilities that, that are required for your business. So in our case, our core competency was really around building the brand, product ideation, new product development, but we, we wanted nothing to do with printing the t-shirts, mm -hmm. sourcing the t-shirts, um, managing employees at a store and all that goes into that, uh, shipping out orders. You know, We did all those things early on uh, and I think it's important to, to do those things manually as I mentioned. Um, and for us, you know, it was handwriting envelopes. We had a storage unit. We'd manually pack envelopes at night. We'd go to a 24-hour post office. Uh, it, it was a lot of those those rough and tumble, grinded yeah. type things. Yeah. Um, but as we grew up, as we grew with the business, we realized what we were good at and what we weren't good at. Good, good at. Mm -hmm. and we were more than happy to kind of outsource those other things. Mm -hmm. So for us, kind of the next big accomplishment was partnering with Underground Printing and opening the store. Uh, that we have today with them on State Street in Madison. Yeah. Uh, so, so that that was definitely uh, a great shining moment, and and continues to be uh, a really rewarding experience. I'd say for myself as a as a founder, as an entrepreneur, there's no better feeling than seeing someone, in our case, wearing your product or using your product or using your service or talking about your product or your service. Um, and it never gets old. It's it's a it's a great you know dopamine release. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned those late nights, stuffing envelopes, doing things manually because people just see you, they see the site, they see the t-shirt everywhere in every store and they think, oh, maybe somehow this was easy and they don't see all those other steps that led to it, you know? Yeah, and there's definitely trade-offs, you know, um, especially doing this while being a student, while being an undergrad. Uh, and for, for, for us, that meant trade-offs. So there was definitely times where, you know, we did have to skip class or multiple classes or we knew that we couldn't study as much because we had other things related to the business that we had to take care of. Uh, and so for us, I think it was just, it was an honest and informed trade-off that we were making. You know, so in my case, I knew that by working on my business, I was going to, you know, have less time for these other academic endeavors. And so on my resume, that might translate into a slightly lower GPA, but I had to w weigh that against this experience, this this other mm -hmm. thing on my resume, which was starting my own company, yeah. and for me, the the kind of the math in my head was, um, if if we totally fail, well, then we have this experience to talk about, and we're still in the same 
applicant pool getting the same degree as all of our peers at mm-hmm. the university. But if we're successful, really the, the, the ceiling is potentially unlimited. Uh, and so that was a trade-off that I was willing to make. I, I think some people get into a rat race, whether they're a student or someone later in life, where they're not cognizant of the trade-off they're making. Maybe they're sac- maybe they have a, a, a traditional full-time job and they don't realize that they're actually slacking mm-hmm. their work and that might lead to them getting fired or, or something of that nature. And, and they're not aware of that trade-off. I, th- I think as long as you are aware of the trade-off you're making, that, um, that's important and the sacrifices that are required as well. Because it's not all glamorous. Right. So what is the, what was the toughest part about running Scouting Nation? What is one of them? The toughest part? Yeah. I'd say it's um, keeping a pulse with pop culture. Um, so whether that relates to our actual products, mm-hmm. meaning the types of garments that we sell. or It's pretty timeless though. I mean, your design and our, our main design, but but our yeah. goal is to to kind of round that out because at the end of the day, you can't have a closet full of the same shirt. We love. I we do love, actually. That's the case. <laughs> yeah, we love that's the case. Uh, but we wanted to round it out. So if we have a great customer that loves our brand, that has our our kind of um, baseline uh, yeah. core product, how can we upsell them and, and continue to have them as a customer? Mm-hmm. And so for us, that meant coming out with new products. So. Yeah. Sometimes that's new slogans, new designs, or just new garments with, with the same slogan or design. What's your process for that? Because that's not an easy thing to do, and yeah. how do you know it's going to hit? Design I w- is tricky. I wish I could say we had a more uh, concrete way to do this, but really it's myself. It's a, it's a couple others um, that basically get on an email together and we'll throw out an idea. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's very amorphous. It's just, hey, is something happening in the news or that we think is relative to kind of the Scani brand? How can we adapt this into a t-shirt? Mm-hmm. Or, hey, here's a trend that I noticed when I was traveling down south. Is this uh, something we could capitalize on in one way or another? Um, so it's things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then those things, they start to, sometimes people will kind of check each other and say, that's totally stupid. No one wants that. Uh, <laughs> and then they just kind of go away. Other times, you know, they'll get to, everyone will kind of chip in, give their own opinion on it. And those things eventually firm up into an actual design. So we'll mm-hmm. get an art proof on it. Uh, and then sometimes we'll just push that live uh, on the site or maybe just in store and see what the response is. Other times we will... Um, uh, have multiple versions of a design or an idea and we'll push it out via social media and ask our fans and followers, hey, what, which do you like more, this one or that one? Um, so, th- so there's different paths that we take. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, despite our best efforts, we're, we're not, we don't bat a thousand. So we, we um, no one does, yeah. not every idea is, is uh, a home run for us. So there's a lot of guests test and revise that goes on with it. But when we have a winner, you know, it's yeah. a, again, it's a great feeling. You yeah. love being able to kind of capture a sentiment uh, with your fan base uh, that resonates with them. Yeah. So, Trey, I have two questions off that. What has been the biggest surprise? Like, you know, you're bouncing ideas. You're like, oh, that's not going to work. That actually really worked. And one that you thought, this is going to just be the sure. biggest hit ever. And it just bombed. So the, the biggest surprise, let's start with, so or, or the biggest um, success. Mm-hmm. So that would have to be our uh, We'll Never Forget You Brent t-shirt, uh, which was poking fun at, at the Brett Favre saga when he was retiring and then not retiring uh, from the Green Bay Packers. Right, yes. Um, and so that came to us. At the time, we were selling a t-shirt that said, uh, Brett is my homeboy. So it was a pro Brett Favre t-shirt when, when he was a member of the Packers. And a uh, customer came into us, a customer who's from Wisconsin, currently lives and works in New York. And um, he said, hey, I want to I wanna create a new, a new t-shirt with this idea I have. And, and the slogan is, we'll, we'll never forget you, Brent. We're going to purposely misspell his name uh, uh, with B-R-E-N-T. Right. Um, and... Uh, we said, oh, we, we thought it was brilliant. And um, so he l- kind of left the design to us. We, we took the, the image that we had been using on that other T-shirt and translated it uh, into a new design, added the slogan for the customer's request, uh, and then got his permission to you know, market it and, and sell it on, on, our, our, on our behalf, on our own, uh, which he granted to us. And, and uh, from there, you know, we put it out online. Uh, and you know it was mildly successful, and then we just got tons of hits on media, online, and we were just selling hundreds and thousands of these T-shirts, um, and it was li- literally our most successful product, uh, single product to date. Um, so we got picked up, you know, by various sports blogs and news sites and whatnot. Um, uh, and there was plenty of knockoffs that happened. Pretty funny. And today you can get it at pretty much any gas station in Wisconsin. Uh, did different variations of this slogan. Um, uh, so that was definitely our biggest success in the form of a surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, you asked about things that are less popular. The reality is, you know, we go through so many that fizzle. I mean, not less popular, but one that you thought this is going to be a huge hit and just man doesn't do well, um, or as well as you thought. You know. Yeah, good question. Um, so I'd say some uh, pro- probably bigger trend-wise, you know, things that we thought would be more successful that, that has not been is is some more vintage references to to different cities in Wisconsin or uh, even, sometimes that's even vintage print. Um, so things that we might internally think are funny. So it's like a cool design type of yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, but then some people might not get the, the reference or whatnot. So it's things like that. Mm-hmm. And the other question I had, Trey, was about co-founders. Obviously, you know, someone's like, that's a dumb idea or whatever. The case. Yeah. How do you navigate um, when you don't agree? Because you're both entrepreneurs. You both probably have strong opinions. And also yeah. this comes into play with Generator when you're probably sure. trying to help the co-founders navigate that. It's a great question. And, um, you know, there's really no silver bullet because yeah. uh, relationships and, and human nature is very dynamic and fluid. And so it's a very relevant question uh, in the case of Scotty Nation. Yeah. You know, I mentioned I started with, with a, a partner who I met as a freshman. Uh, we were both 19 when we started the company. Um, and the reality is that, you know, I mentioned we did a lot of that legwork and we were kind of like sponges for information about how to properly set things up. And a lot of the advice we got. Um, very consistently was you need to have an operating agreement where you and your partner are agreeing on all these things, whether it's the equity split or right. how do you end the partnership and all these things. And yeah. we kept ignoring that advice mostly because um, we didn't want to take the time or it was an uncomfortable subject. Or mm. you know, It is kind of uncomfortable, yeah. The reality was that we got along and we're good friends and everything like that. But life changes. And so in our case, that was um, when we graduated from college. You know, The company was profitable. It was successful. But it wasn't ultimately profitable enough um, as 50-50 owners for both of us to, to, to live off of, it, off of the proceeds. Um, in my case, I was sticking around. I was going to law school and uh, to, to business school at Madison. And my co-founder was going to start a full-time job doing sales on the West Coast. Um, and so it became this dilemma where uh, we never agreed on, you know, does one partner, if they're actually doing s- some tasks or work, do they get some sort of salary as compensation in addition mm-hmm. to just the profits and so forth? Um, and so that became a bit of a contentious issue. Um, right. Ultimately, I, you know, I um, proposed that I buy my partner out. And again, we had no defined procedure on how to value the company or right. how the buyout would take place. And that was unfortunate uh, because it led to a lot of negotiation and because someone over, you know, they worked on it. It's like yeah, very close right. and personal, and you feel it's your baby, and you may overvalue it even. Exactly, and know. both sides feel that way, right? So, so both sides have their own worldview and their own perspective. And so, uh, from the moment I proposed the buyout until we actually had an agreement and, and the buyout was completed, um, it took over a year, and unfortunately, it did put a big strain on our friendship. Yeah. Uh, and really, only until recently have we gotten to, to be more close again, gotten to be friends again. Um, and I'd say that's kind of, of the whole Scani story, that's the the saddest part about it is, is how we started as this very organic friends coming together, uh, creating a company, creating a brand. And, you know, there was that falling out that, you know, we've we've repaired since then. But um, that's just kind of the, the dirtiness of entrepreneurship. We could have solved that had we taken the advice that we got. Yeah. Um, but we chose to ignore, unfortunately. But creating an operating agreement, creating all these expectations, policies, procedures up front yeah. for how we handle some of those situations. And so, when we, when today, when I work with founders and entrepreneurs at Generator, right. uh, we're very explicit, um, and we make that our investment contingent on them having these things in place, having a shareholder agreement um, with the partners, having the equity splits already defined. Um, and those arrangements already created. Uh, that being said, you can have the most perfect agreement and you're still going to run into si- situations or scenarios that um, you haven't thought about that are outside of what the agreement stipulates. Mm-hmm. And so in those cases, I think it's just most important to communicate um, to the extent you have outside advisors or shareholders or investors or board members. I think uh, relying on their mentorship and advice can be in- important as well. Yeah, sure. I'm so glad you brought that up because – that's what people are thinking when they start a company, like, sh- how should we navigate this? Oh, let's just see what happens. And they never put something in place. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what is one of those scenarios with Generator, with one of the, that you were advising one of the companies and kind of how it played out now because you do know 
Yeah, yeah good question. So, so one one big thing uh, that that we make as a requirement that I think is important, uh, especially for companies that are raising outside money, um, just because then you have more more stakeholders. You, you literally have more shareholders, but just more stakeholders in general in the business. The one thing that I think is the most important piece is is vesting of your of your stock. So, if let's say a company comes to us, there's two founders, it's a new startup. Uh, we require that the founders. Um, uh, even if they're agreeing to split their equity, how, however or however which way, that none of their shares are actually vested, fully vested, until a year after they've worked with the company. Um, that way, if if in that first year there's any disagreements, uh, and you'll know pretty well after a year whether it's a fit or not, then you know that person can be fired or removed or whatnot, and there's no harm. They they're, they're not walking away with a significant chunk of the company, which could be detrimental to the future success of that company. Mm -hmm. The other thing is after that year, we then uh, further acquire investing for the remaining three years. So we call it a four-year investing period with a one-year cliff, um, and so that more or less is a requirement with, with every company that we're making an investment in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is just best practices in general, uh, but it's it's things that I've experienced in my own life and other entrepreneurs that we've worked with have experienced the, the downside of not having it set up that way. Um, and so I think that's a good uh, tactical example of, of a way mm -hmm. to structure yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. That is very valuable. And, uh, you know, I want you to talk about Generator, but anything else, any stories or lessons from Scotty Nation that, would be important to talk about. Yeah, you know, um, I have a strong belief that when, when entrepreneurs of any type, these could be traditional small businesses, lifestyle businesses, high impact, high growth startups, you name it, uh, entrepreneurs just and people in general, when they encounter turbulence or uncertainty or any sense of um, fear, when fear sets in, they tend to revert to their comfort zone or their core competency. So if you're a developer, a programmer, and you, you're you scared to talk to customers, you might not verbalize it that way, but, but that's what's going on. Mm. Uh, you're, you're tending to revert back to what you know, and, and that's head down programming code. Uh, if you're a really good salesperson and you want to, um, uh, and you're afraid of encountering bugs in the product, you're probably not gonna kind of reach out of your comfort zone and, and, and opine on issues related to the code or the product. Yeah. Uh, it's just human nature in that regard. Um, that being said, I think it's an important exercise for entrepreneurs to always be curious and always uh, want to, to know enough about you know different functions of their business from end to end um, and explore those things because you gain valuable insights. So for me, the last thing with Scani, the last thing I wanted to do was get up early on football Saturday game days and street vent. Um, but in reality, in the early days of our company, that that was really formative, and we learned a lot. Um, and I think an experience like street vending, something very manual, very kind of true hustling, uh, is an eye-opening experience because you realize that most people aren't listening to your kind of uh, calls to come visit your table or pick up a piece of merchandise or buy a T-shirt, um, and they just have blinders on. And, and and the average consumer, you know what amount of effort does it take to get their attention one yeah. and two what amount of effort does it take to, to once you have their attention to convert the sale or the right. purchase um, and so I think understanding that and experiencing it um, goes beyond what any sort of amount of planning or business plan mm -hmm. uh, could ever provide so what got their attention <laughs> uh, so one thing I learned is um, making eye contacts important, um, pointing at them and handing them something. So that could just be a flyer or a piece of merchandise okay. to actually touch and feel yeah. and engage in that process. Uh, that's one way to get their attention. So you actually convert a purchase. You know, it's just saying things like, oh, that looks great or that's our most popular shirt or I think your son or daughter would love that. Um, just reaffirming their their belief in mm -hmm. in their decision. Yeah, I love that. Um, so, Troy, <laughs> tell me about Generator then. So, yeah. how did it come about? So, uh, myself uh, uh, and Joe Kurgis, Dan Armbrust, John Eckert, Joel Abraham. Um, yeah, you have an impressive group of co-founders. Yeah, a group yeah. of five of us. Yeah. Uh, we came together a little over two years ago. Um, both uh, me and Joe, uh, we act as full-time kind of managing directors of the program. Uh, we met uh, via law. So, we were both lawyers. Uh, we were practicing law. Uh, I was working for a program uh, in Madison called the Law and Entrepreneurship Clinic, which provided free legal services to startups and entrepreneurs. 
Um, Joe was working for a law firm in Milwaukee and representing folks on the investor side of things. And we got to meet each other kind of indirectly through those channels um, in our various careers. And we both shared the same passion, I think, for startups and helping entrepreneurs, specifically in, in Wisconsin, but more broadly the Midwest. And so with that, um, we were fortunate to find uh, Dan Armbrust, uh, who, who became our lead investor, uh, who shared a similar commitment. And um, the whole time we were envious of kind of things that Paul Graham had done with creating Y Combinator and later mm -hmm. folks like Brad Feld and David Cohen, uh, the success they had creating Techstars and kind of proliferating that model. Uh, and so we saw a lot of value in the accelerator model and wanted to, to bring it to life. And so we were fortunate to find the, the individuals like Dan to, to put up the money to create mm -hmm. Uh, generator and have been doing it for about a little over two years since then mm -hmm. and so uh, we run two programs a year uh, in the winter we do a three-month accelerator program in Madison and in the summer slash fall we do a three-month accelerator program in Milwaukee mm -hmm. and for both of those programs we're looking for just early stage technology enabled businesses um, and we scour the country even the world looking for the best startups and entrepreneurs that we can find and we encourage them to apply online we have a competitive application process um, once they fill out an application online we review it as a group uh, we then narrow the applicant pool down we have two rounds of interviews at each stage we're, we're narrowing the applicant pool further down uh, and then we ultimately select five companies to, to make an investment in so to give you an example for kind of the, the competitive nature of it for for our most recent program we had over 450 uh, applications wow. and from that pool we, we selected just five companies um, and you know we're, we're very fortunate and blessed to have so much interest and and mm. some of it you what know, do you look for I mean I interviewed actually one of your companies I interviewed one of the founders of Eat Street and oh. uh, and so they've had a tremendous success yeah yeah um, so, so what do you... our mo the most important qualities that we're looking for is just the team, the people. Mm -hmm. So how passionate are they? Are, do, are they coming from a place where they have a unique insight on a problem and a unique insight on, on creating a solution to that problem? Mm -hmm. um, furthermore, is it a complete team? So if you're proposing something software-based, do you have someone that can actually develop the software versus you're contracting mm -hmm. that out? That's just a, an example. Uh, so we're looking for uh, passion in the team and the people, uh, experience in the team and the people, but then also a completeness in the team. Uh, secondly, uh, from for our financial model to work based on the investment that we're making and the equity that we're receiving and kind of the additional dilution that will happen over time and subsequent rounds of financing, mm -hmm. we're looking for uh, ideas and people that can execute on opportunities that, that are attacking just a, a very large market. So we want companies that at some point and in, in hopefully the, the sooner rather than later, but can have exit values of between you know 10 to $100 million. Yeah. Um, that's what we're looking for. So someone just starting, you know, a company like mine, Scotty Nation, uh, which is kind of like a local spin to it, probably would it would you'd not. Re you'd reject it. yourself. <laughs> I'd reject myself. <laughs> um, uh, but someone doing something like Mad and, and Eric at Eat Street, um, which has a huge total addressable market and a product that can go international, um, you know, that's something that we we look very favorably on. So, what are some of the big mistakes you see some of the companies you bring on? Yeah. Uh, so one, uh, you know, I'll start with mistakes that I see when, when people apply. One thing yeah. would be um, stating that they have no competition or what they're doing is so unique and so proprietary that, that it's, there's no competition. Uh, the reality is that, you know, we live in a gigantic world with tons of people, all with their own unique ideas. Um, and to think that something is so unique or so proprietary is, is, is slightly right. logically foolish. Um, and furthermore, you always have competition, even if it's just the status quo, meaning what right. people do today, that is your competition. And I think acknowledging that and being aware of that is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, what else with the, that's a, that's a good point, what else do people make mistakes with when applying? When applying, I'd say um, sometimes a lack of uh, communication. So uh, th this is more what, what can help an application. Uh, one thing that could really help is um, communicating. So to the extent that you may apply on week one and the application deadlines on, on week six, well, what happened on week four or week five? Did you have a big account? Did you get a new customer? Did your revenue increase by X percent? Um, did you add a new team member to round out your team? So mm -hmm. being in constant communication, there, 
what I like to say is I, I get tons of emails and, and I'm not bothered by any of them. Keep emailing me. Give me updates. I prefer to have more information than, than less information and being mm -hmm. forced to guess. So don't make mm -hmm. me guess. And if you have good news, please share it. Mm -hmm. So that would be, that'd be another tip. So what about after? What are the biggest so, mistakes you see? In terms of the companies that we've invested in, yeah. uh, what are what are things that they can struggle with or encounter? I think again it goes back to or you help them avoid or you, you know yeah, because yeah. they have this mentorship they would have maybe gone this path but you're sure. like no you shook them a little bit and they realized so I, it. So I'd say in our case it's um, focus on your customer. So we really want to position ourselves as a customer driven accelerator mm -hmm. and and by that I mean not just B two C companies or consumer companies but no matter what type of company it is, B2B, enterprise, uh, B2B mm -hmm. to C, you name it, we want to make sure that you're focused on getting out there uh, and seeing customers face to face, mm -hmm. uh, getting feedback in the marketplace and trying to sell your product. Um, I think too often entrepreneurs try to say, you know, uh, well, I talked to one customer and they're interested, but it needs X, Y, and Z. And so I quickly told them that we're going to build X, Y, and Z. The, re the reality is you need to stand on your own two feet and realize that what you've built today, even without those features, has some level of value. Mm -hmm. and, and and verify and validate that that's true. It might not be true, but hopefully it's true. Uh, and verify and validate that that's true and be confident enough to sell what you have today rather than quickly folding uh, in a sales process and saying like, well, I'll come back to you when we have that. Because you're never gonna make everyone happy and you need to focus on what you have today and, and reassure yourself that it does have value in the market and then sell that. Don't sell um, you know, something to be made, sell what you have today, knowing that in the background you are going to be improving the product, and year over year, month over month, mm -hmm. the product itself will improve. Mm -hmm. Has any of the ones uh, companies you brought on surprised you, and how? You know, uh, always. So in different ways. So uh, you know, if we were to handicap our companies uh, from the moment we extend an offer to them, from you know our favorite to, to least favorite. Um, I would say that that ranking would never be true 12 weeks later. Right, it all yeah. moves about. And then furthermore, I'd say if we were to rank the companies from our favorites or our least favorite at the end of the program and then check in six months later, a year later, two years later, that would even be untrue. So the reality is you just can't predict who's going to be the, the biggest success. Uh, and therefore, all your babies are beautiful and, and you need to um, treat them all equally and, and realize that um, you, you can't predict the future and that – uh, people kind of hit stride at different points in the life cycle of a company. And while I'd wish I did have a perfect crystal ball which could predict into the future, as does every investor, um, we live in a it's dynamic tough. marketplace and yeah. things change. Yeah, it's very tough. Very tough. And, you know, but what one or two factors do you look for that you found maybe to be common even though things shift kind of yeah, across I, so the Yeah, what board? I like to say is, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, work, work smarter, not harder. I totally, totally agree with that. Totally agree. That being said, at, at an early stage, the you can't always control what your customer or the decision maker or your partner is going to, to do. Mm -hmm. Are they going to say yes? Are they going to be a customer? Are they going to pay you? You can't always control that. Mm -hmm. But you can control a certain level of activity, whether that's outbound sales activity, whether that's developing the product type of activity, whether that's working with your supply chain or channel partners, that type of activity. That you can control. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that's controllable, you know, I want to see entrepreneurs that are totally committed and just working working their butts off mm -hmm. to to accomplish their goal. Kind of the joke I like to say is. Um, Becoming a multimillionaire is not easy. No one said it was going to be easy. And if that's what you want to be as an entrepreneur that we're investing in, you know, you got to put in the requisite amount of work uh, to accomplish that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Troy, I wish we had another hour. Um, I uh, have, have a question since it's Inspired Insider, which is what's been the lowest point in, in how you push through yeah. those tough times? And then what's been one of the proudest moments? Yeah. So I'd say the, you know, in my entire kind of entrepreneurial experience, the, the lowest, toughest time was really um, when, when I had to negotiate and talk to my partner at Scotty Nation about buying them out. I mean, that process took over a year to accomplish and it took a lot of tough phone calls and bitter arguments and, uh, you know, mean emails back and forth and, and um, you know, actual or veiled threats on both sides. And um, I think that whole process, 
process was unfortunate. And what was even more unfortunate is that I think had we taken advice we got earlier on, we could have avoided it either entirely or, or substantially. Um, so that was definitely the emotionally the toughest part because you go from a great friend starting a great company mm-hmm. and then kind of having a falling out. Um, so, yeah. so, so that was definitely the toughest experience. And, and unfortunately, it's not uncommon for entrepreneurs to, to have a falling out with, it could be between, with their investors or with their co-founders or, or you name it. Um, so that's enough of the negative. On the positive yeah. side. Yeah, what's the proud, the one of the proud, proud moments? Yeah, I'd, yeah. Have to, I'd have to split it into two things. One, yeah. it's uh, on the Scotty side, it's continuing to see customers engage with the brand. Uh, it's it's walking around uh, Madison or even random parts of the country and randomly seeing someone who you don't know wearing your t-shirt. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's a great feeling. Um, on the generator side of things, I'd say it's whenever our companies can can have a positive outcome. So whether that's gaining more users, getting more traction, getting more revenue, more customers, or follow-on financing. It's when those events and those tidbits of good news come through. Uh, there's no better feeling as, as a, an accelerator you know, manager than, than getting those pieces of good news. And, and really, I think it's a reflection of just the passion and hard work that the entrepreneurs that we're investing in, you know, put into their companies, and they deserve to be rewarded. But uh, actually, you know, hearing that good news is is always a great feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I, what, what I like to say is, within a portfolio, I think this is true not only for accelerators but you know, venture capitalists and so forth. Um, managing the companies that are doing really great and, and great things are happening is a breeze. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of hard work. It's really the companies that are struggling more, um, that require more of your attention and more of your assistance. Mm-hmm. Um, so all things, you know, I'd, I'd love to have every company, you know, being wildly successful. Mm-hmm. But again, unfortunately, we don't have that perfect crystal ball mm-hmm. to predict these things. Plug some of the companies that are doing well so people can yeah. check them out. So you, so you got to see Eat Street. That's eatstreet.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's an online food court, online food delivery. Uh, so if, if you log into eatstreet.com, you can order Chinese food. They have an beer. amazing story yeah. also. Yeah. Yeah, they over 15,000 restaurants on their platform and growing at a great pace. Uh, another cool company, uh, one of my favorites, is a company called Live Blends. They're currently based out of San Francisco. Um, they sell wonderfully nutritious smoothies that are you mm. know, recipes designed by master chefs. Uh, they use a variety of organic or you know, very healthy ingredients. No sugar added, no pasteurization or anything like that. And, and they're also currently working on a, a smart blender where you could think of it as a Keurig machine, a home appliance where you can put a frozen pot in and then it'll actually oh. blend with a fresh smoothie. A ready awesome. single serve smoothie. So um, Live Blends uh, is another favorite of ours. Um, you know, we have things all over. We have things in the healthcare space like Catalyze. They make a HIPAA compliant uh, or a HIPAA um, uh, compliant platform for develop software developers to build on top of. So uh, that if they're building anything in the healthcare space, it's they big can issue. Yeah. build on top of uh, Catalyze's platform to to ensure compliance. Um, all the way to companies like Men's Style Lab, which is uh, they're a competitor tr- to Trunk Club, uh, but for the middle market. So um, they mm-hmm. allow guys who don't like to shop or guys who don't have a good sense of style or fashion to work with one of their uh, style advisors yeah. uh, on the phone or via email and then get a curated box of clothing uh, sent to their door so that they can yeah. try it on in the comfort of their own home. Yeah. They can send back what they don't want. They only pay for what they keep. Um, so co- companies like that, uh, we, and we have a lot of fun with them. Yeah. You have them measure them up and you go, you look in a Scotty t-shirt. Yeah. No. Right. <laughs> I, I, uh, I should pitch that to the, to Darian, to the CEO. I should say, just slip a, a Scotty shirt into each box, but um, I don't think that would fly too well in Illinois. So Troy, I appreciate <laughs> your time. Just tell people where, where can they check you out, check the companies yeah. out. Yeah, definitely. So i uh, love for the fans out there to check out scanny.com, S-C-O-N-N-I-E.com. And on the generator side of things, that's G-E-N-E-R-8, the digit 8, T-O-R.com. And we're currently accepting applications until January 1st of 2015 for our, for our next program, which will take place in Madison. So we'd love for you to, to check us out or just explore our portfolio companies online. And anyone can apply no matter what part of the country no you're in. And we, from all over the world, and, and in fact, we have made investments for in country in, in companies that have come from outside the United States. So uh, we're very open to to people coming from all over, and even in all industries. So whether it's food and beverage to fashion to uh, healthcare, IT, you know, we've invested in all those things. Yeah. Troy, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You got it. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it.
Take care. Bye-bye now.